Hello, in this video I'm going to talk about the YouTuber who calls himself Onision. I've had a few people uh, write to me or, or write in the comments section asking for videos about him. So I've looked him up and there's quite a lot of information on him. So he's quite a good one to look at in terms of examples. He allegedly groomed teenage girls. One of them was only 13 when she first um, sent a message to him and they came through his YouTube channel. They were fans of his. He's got a lot of um, teenage fans who are girls. So, um, so this is, you know, that's what happened with this girl. And then she ended up living with him and his wife. He uh, met his wife when she was just 16 and there was quite an age gap. I think he was 26 at that time and so there was quite a big um, age difference. And then uh, when she was old enough, they got married and then they fostered this girl, Sarah. Sarah is now accusing both of them of having groomed her and um, the guy who calls himself Onision, he has admitted that he did have sex with her after she turned 18. And this seems to be the common theme amongst these women that, um, that they were groomed when they were still teenagers and then when they turned 18, he would have sex with them. Not all of them, but I think even with the ones that he didn't, there was something inappropriate about the messages that he was sending them. He was also emotionally abusive in his relationships and someone called Shiloh has spoken out about this. Um, she's a singer, she's got a successful singing career, she was doing really well even before she met him. Before they met when she was still 17, they'd message and at the time he was with his first wife. And she's written quite a few tweets about what happened so I thought I'd read some of these tweets. Uh, and you know, and tell the story through her words. I want to warn you that this is a really disturbing story. So it might it might trigger some of you if you've experienced narcissistic abuse in the past. So um, you know, maybe just think about that and and just decide if if it's a good idea to watch this. And if you do start getting disturbed, you can always pause the video and just decide if you want to continue or, or not. Um, so, I want to add in here that, um, that this is all from one person's perspective. So we're hearing what happened from only one person and we don't have a response from this uh, guy, Anissian, who, who calls himself Anissian. So, um, so because of that, um, it, it, you know, it might not be reliable. And it's hard for me to say that because um, because I personally believe that it happened. So, um, but, but I, you know, I, I, I feel that I do need to be clear about that and that I'm not saying he's a narcissist. On the other hand, mm -hmm. if what she's saying is true, then I think that he is. And that there may be, you know, he may have other, um, he may have traits, he may have more traits than just of narcissistic personality disorder. I'd go as far as to say that he's a sociopath because he gets off on hurting her. Um, so, so it's not, it wouldn't be just that, um, it's, it wouldn't just be a, a defense mechanism, but also, you know, a sort of pleasure that he's deriving from, not just, not just the, the kind of pleasure that a narcissist gets from getting an emotional reaction, but, um, but a real joy in someone's pain and, and, and actually enough to get turned on by it. So, um, and, and, and I've, I've talked about this before and said that a sociopath, that's not a clinical term. Um, and, and I made a video about, um, sorry, it's really loud here. <laughs> I'm, I'm right on a road. Anyway, um, I made a video about, uh, you know, about Chris Watts and a couple of other murderers and whether they're psychopaths or whether they have antisocial personality disorder. So maybe watch that if you're interested. I'll put a link. If I, I'll try to remember. If I don't, uh, maybe someone could remind me. Um, but I'll, I'll put, a, if I can, I'll put a link in the comments section um, to. 
uh, for that video. So she says we talked for around eight months every day on Skype for almost eight to ten hours of the day. So that sounds intense, doesn't it? And um, and that sounds quite typical of a narcissist that they will dive into a relationship head first, you know, and spend all their time with this person or just as much time as possible. It's really intense. And the reason they do this is because it's a way to um, it's a way to pin that person down and, and get them to become dependent on them as quickly as possible. So she says, um, she says, Sky was normally online shopping in the background. And, uh, and that would make sense because Sky is his, was his wife. So she says, Sky was normally online shopping in the background while Greg was editing videos and on Skype with me. I was just a fan turned friend at the time. So Sky was his first wife. So at this point, she was under the impression that they were just friends, but she just thought he was really cool. Uh, and then she says, December 2010, while I was 17, I received a call from Onision on Skype showing me the divorce papers or whatever bogus contract he wrote up that he had made Sky sign earlier that night. This was the first time he told me he loved me. So it sounds like that wasn't true and they hadn't actually, um, that she found out later that they hadn't actually had divorce papers. Uh, and, and I think that um, I think that she did say in an interview that this was all a lie, and actually he wasn't getting a divorce at that time, so he was cheating on his wife with her. She carries on to say, "Do you remember checking the state laws before coming to PA a few days after telling me you were leaving Sky for me to make sure you could have sex with a 17-year-old?" So before they met, he checked the law. So you can see that sex was right at the front of his mind. You know that, um, and and that, and he and she says that this was straight after leaving Sky for me. When you hit a deer with your car and wrecked it on your way to PA, you bought a plane ticket instead. That's interesting that it sounds like he was driving erratically. That can be the sign of somebody who um, isn't afraid to take risks and is quite reckless. And you know, that's a sign of mental instability. It's also a sign of a psychopath. And I, I'm not, I don't want to suggest that he is a psychopath because there's lots of things that would have to, um, you know, I, I did a video about this, but there's lots of boxes that have to be ticked for him to be called one. But it certainly is one of the characteristics, just not being afraid of things that other people would be afraid of, you know, in dangerous situations and to put yourself into the path of risk. You showed up at my hotel room and you slept with me within five minutes. I can't wait to get you pregnant. The first words I heard you say in person. So this would have been overwhelming for a 17 year old girl. This was the first time they'd met in person and he didn't say anything to her. He just came in uh, and you know, the first thing he said was, I can't wait to get you pregnant. So um, that's, that's really, really full on, isn't it? For a 17 year old girl. And then he was pretty much straight away having sex with her. So again, that says something about the kind of relationship that was um, starting between them, that, that sex was really at the forefront of his mind, that he had to check the law because she was so young and he had to check that he wasn't going to get in trouble for having sex with her. And then the first thing he said was about sex. Um, and, and also getting her pregnant, you know, to say, I can't wait to get you pregnant, that, that sounds, um, I mean, for the first time you sleep with someone, that's a pretty full on thing to say, isn't it? And, and it makes me think about ownership and control and how, uh, in his mind, 
course, if she was pregnant, then she'd be more dependent, um, a bit more helpless at, at the age of 17 as well. You know, that um, it, it doesn't seem already, it doesn't seem like um, a, a sort of balanced relationship. It seems like he's in a big rush to pin her down. And that can be the sign of someone who's really controlling. My mother notified the hotel that you were there and the police arrived. We were asked to leave because of the camera equipment in the room. So the fact that her mother notified the police, I mean, that sounds like the mother was pretty stressed out and worried about her. Um, so, and that was probably already causing tension in her relationship with her mother. So it sounds like he certainly wasn't sensitive to that. You know, if he was aware of that beforehand, he wasn't taking any measures to reassure his, um, the girl's mother. Your computer was searched for child pornography. I was sent home. You flew back to Tacoma. You started to alienate me from my mother. So that sort of fits with what we've already learned, that he certainly wasn't showing respect for their relationship. Um, and so this is when that begins, that he's starting to alienate her. That's another sign of one of these controlling people who, uh, you know, they try to alienate their partner to make them as vulnerable as possible and as dependent on them as possible. And this is the sign of, this is what a really narcissistic person does. And, uh, and then of course, beyond that, the other um, frightening, <laughs> you know, people who have antisocial personality disorder, psychopaths, you know, any, anyone who is um, ruthless and controlling is going to try to get their partner to be as um, vulnerable and dependent as possible so that that way they have more control and they can really get away with whatever they like because this person is at their weakest. Shortly after the PA incident, you rented an apartment in my city for a few months while you waited for me to turn 18. So again, there's this really creepy feeling that sex is so important to him and that this, this is a girl who's uh, not, not really ready. You know, that's the feeling I get. But, um, because also she says, well, he waited for her to turn 18, not while we waited. So you, you get this feeling that she's this vulnerable young girl and everything is already about sex in his mind that he's even moving to this city and just waiting there for her to turn 18. In this time, you manipulated me into cutting off both my parents from my life. So that's again, um, you know, this alienation that's happening. And, um, and it's interesting how she says you manipulated me because, you know, you kind of wonder, well, what, what did he say? What kind of thing? was he saying to her that was convincing about her parents because she was looking up to him thinking he was this really cool guy who would have been quite a few years older than her. I lived in that apartment with you until you flew me to Tacoma on my birthday. Anyway, when it comes to a narcissist, um, sex would be important at the beginning of a relationship for two reasons. One is because they can't have an intimate relationship with anyone. So the kind of relationship they're gonna have is gonna be a superficial one. Um, and so, you know, there's not gonna be emotional intimacy. Also, it's about control. So, uh, and, and here's a, a really young girl. Uh, so, um, and here's the guy with lots of experience. So that's gonna, um, it's gonna be about control for him. You convinced me to get your name tattooed on me to show you I loved you. You told me you would do the same. I came home with Gregory tattooed on me as a surprise. You got remember love in return. So she got his name tattooed onto her, onto herself, because they'd had this agreement that that's what they were gonna do, but of course he didn't do that. So he wasn't going to commit to her. In his mind, he wasn't ready to commit to her, but he had convinced her to be so ready to commit that she was prepared to get his name on her body. And she was just 17. 
So that sounds about right as well, that a narcissist will expect the other person to completely, uh, pretty much lay their life down for them, you know, to give them everything. And, uh, but it's never even, you know, there's never any kind of equal relationship between them. The, the person who is with the narcissist is going to end up giving more and more and more to the relationship to try to make it work. And the narcissist in return gives less and less. So at the beginning they give um, a lot, but actually it turns out that what they're giving isn't real. You know, they give a lot of flattery um, and um, attention, but then it turns out that there's nothing really there and they get less and less of that attention as the relationship goes on. And we'll see that happen across these um, notes that she's written. Remember when I left you while we were living in that apartment because I found Sky's sister's boudoir photos on your computer and you admitted to me that you Googled them yourself, got off to them and then showed me all the other porn you were watching behind my back. And this is a 17 year old girl. So that's a lot for her to get her head around. Um, she would have felt really betrayed and it would have been really creepy that he was looking at these photos of his ex-wife's sister in her underwear and he was masturbating to that. So the fact that this person wasn't even, um, she wasn't even from a magazine or from porn on the internet, she was actually a real person who had been in his life. So that's gonna be pretty weird for someone who's in a committed relationship with him, who's tattooed his name on her body, um, you know, to have that his masturbating to someone he has known who's in the real world and also the sister of his ex-wife. I mean, that says a lot about the kind of person he is. Was it one week or two weeks after I moved in that you started locking me out of the editing room to masturbate to porn while I cried and begged you not to? This is definitely one of the most disturbing things to me in this story because it's so cruel. And when she says, was it one week or two weeks after she'd moved in? I mean, that's really recent for the abuse to begin. And, it's, and it, it is abuse. It's, uh, it's very cruel behavior. So he's seen that when she found porn in his room, she left him briefly. So he knows how much that affects her. And he's actually locking her out of the room in the house that they're sharing so that he can masturbate over other women. That's, that really shows that he has no empathy and that he's getting off on her pain actually quite literally getting off you know um the the fact that not only does he not feel her pain and does he not care but he can actually get turned on enough um to to be masturbating while she's in all of this pain while she's crying behind the door so that that really suggests that he enjoys her pain so there have been loads of red flags so far that she hasn't listened to. I mean, at this stage, the abuse has become really, really bad and she's still there. Um, she's, you know, she was saying that he manipulated her away from her parents and I didn't say anything at the time about what role she played in that, but she did play one. You know, she has decided to um, go along with this. Now, she's obviously at a big disadvantage because she's really young, so she's really vulnerable. And now that she's been convinced by this cool older guy that her parents, um, you know, that, that they're no good, that they get in her way or whatever he's been saying to her, um, she's now isolated and she's much more vulnerable. She's living in his house, she's moved from her city, um, her career is, is at this point beginning to change because um, having seen an interview with her, she was saying that her singing career was going really well, but then when she moved in with him, she moved away from her management and in the end they dropped her. So she's becoming more and more dependent on him and he's crossed the line now a few times. There's been, there's been uh, now different things that he's done that she feels uncomfortable with. 
So he's already crossed some major boundaries now. He crossed the boundary with the tattoo. That would have been a really big betrayal and a huge red flag that they arranged to write each other's names and he didn't. But by that time, she already had his name on her. So, um, so she, she would have felt like she's already in pretty deep. And that was the kind of thing that kept happening because, you know, of course, she'd moved in with him. So again, she was vulnerable to him. She had um, uh, left her parents behind her. So again, she was really in a weak position. Um, and she, she did briefly leave when she found the pawn, but then she came back again. So she's shown him that she's prepared to ignore her boundaries for him. So he can see this, you know, he knows now that he's in a really powerful position. And from here on, it's only going to get worse. So when he ends up um, locking the door and not letting her in while he masturbates, that's him really lording it over her and, um, and really enjoying his power. So all of the manipulation at the beginning of her, when she was just 17, it went on for eight months apparently. Um, you know, the grooming, I think we can call it. All these messages and, and chats over Skype that would go on the whole day. Um, and, and it's all led to this, to, to her being under his control in his house, crying behind the door. I'm going to continue in another video because it's getting dark. So if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe and I'll see you in the next video.